Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous two videos, we looked at the anterior compartment of the forearm, and we saw that those muscles are primarily wrist flexors with a few other functions scattered in there. Here, we're obviously going to be looking at the posterior compartment, and what you should really think about is these muscles would be the antagonists of those in the anterior compartment because these are going to be wrist extensors with a few other functions scattered in there. And also the arrangement of these is going to be very similar. Case in point, in the flexor compartment on the anterior side, most of those muscles, particularly in the superficial anterior compartment, those originated on the medial epicondyle. And remember that the medial epicondyle was considered the common flexor origin of those muscles. Well here, most of these muscles in the superficial compartment are going to originate instead on the lateral epicondyle. And so for that reason, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus will be considered the common extensor origin. So without further ado, let's go in and look at these muscles here, and they're color-coded. So the first one we're going to be looking at is here in purple. This is extensor carpi ulnaris, this muscle right here. So this muscle originates on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, that's the common extensor origin, and the fibers project distally, and we're going to see that they're going to insert at the base of the fifth metacarpal. So the extensor carpi ulnaris is going to be mainly responsible for extending the wrist, but doing so at the fifth digit. Okay? It's not going to have any movements of the fifth digit because it's inserting way up here on the base of the fifth metacarpal. So it's not going to be moving any of these interphalangeal joints or anything like that. It's going to extend the wrist, but it's going to do so on the side of the fifth digit. It's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve, and as we mentioned, it's going to extend the wrist, but also because it's able to insert on this side of the wrist, it's going to facilitate ulnar deviation of the wrist. Okay? The second muscle here is called extensor digiti minimi. This is this muscle here in green that you can kind of see sandwiched between extensor carpi ulnaris in purple and the one we're going to look at in a few minutes called extensor digitorum. Now, the origin of extensor digiti minimi is actually on the ulnar side of extensor digitorum. So actually this muscle, extensor digiti minimi, some consider it actually just an extension of extensor digitorum considering that its origin is actually just the proximal part of this muscle. And so after it comes off of extensor digitorum and becomes its own separate muscle, again the fibers extend distally, we can see it in green right here, and they're going to insert on the extensor expansion of digit 5. Now we haven't gone into the extensor expansions yet, we'll do that at some point in this playlist, but they're ex essentially just these fascial coverings um, that cover the tissue of these digits. You can see those here on digits 5, 4, 3, and 2. Okay? So these are the extensor, extensor expansions. Okay? And we see here that extensor digiti minimi is actually inserting onto the base of that expansion right here. Notice that extensor digiti minimi has a small communication here with extensor digitorum. And the extensor digiti minimi muscle is innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve. And because it's inserting on the extensor expansion of the fifth digit, it's going to be able to extend the fifth digit. So it doesn't actually extend the wrist. It actually extends the fifth digit, in particular at uh, the metacarpal phalangeal joint. These next two muscles are these shown in blue right here. This one is extensor carpi radialis longus. And this one that actually goes a little bit underneath the longus is extensor carpi radialis brevis. Both of these muscles originate from the lateral epicondyle, the common extensor origin of the arm. The major difference in these muscles really lies in their insertion. This one over here, this was extensor carpi radialis longus. If we follow its tendon down, very hard to see here. They didn't actually color code it when it gets past uh, the wrist. But this is right here is actually the tendon of extensor carpi radialis longus. It's actually inserting at the base of the second metacarpal, that is your index finger. And then this one was extensor carpi radialis brevis. This one, if we follow its tendon down, is actually going toward the base of the third metacarpal. So again, the longest part, base of second metacarpal, brevis part, base of the third metacarpal. 
Both of these muscles are going to extend the wrist, so wrist extension, and they're going to radially deviate at the wrist. And another difference between these is the innervation. Extensor carpi radialis longus is innervated by the radial nerve, and then extensor carpi radialis brevis is innervated by the deep radial nerve, or the deep branch of the radial nerve. Now let's go to muscle 5. This is extensor digitorum communis, sometimes just shortened to extensor digitorum. That's this yellow muscle here that I said we'd come back to. Again, this muscle is going to originate at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, the common extensor origin. If we follow the fibers distally, once they get to the wrist, we can see that the fibers are going to diverge into four separate tendons. Okay? Um, these are each going to go to the extensor expansions, just like we saw for extensor digiti minimi. So if we look here, we have the extensor expansion of digit 5, that of 4, 3, and 2. And if we look at the tendon of this muscle as it diverges, we can see that this part of it is going to insert on the extensor expansion of the index finger, that is digit 2. This one is going to 3. This one is going to 4 and then this one is going to 5 as it fuses with the tendon of extensor digiti minimi. If we look specifically for tendons 3, 4, and 5, we can see some tendinous communication right here, which actually strengthens the pull of this muscle when it's extending the fingers. And that's actually what it does. It actually extends digits 2 through 5. So extensor digitorum communis doesn't really act at the wrist. It actually acts at the digits in particular because it's inserting on the extensor expansions, just like extensor digiti minimi. Okay? Um, and this muscle is going to be innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve, just like the extensor digiti minimi, which makes sense because extensor digiti minimi is an extension of extensor digitorum communis. All right, the last two muscles we're going to look at are brachioradialis and the ancaneus muscle, and we're actually going to look at them on this slide. I've actually got them listed over here. We covered these in separate videos, but technically these are part of the posterior compartment of the forearm. So this right here, this muscle is brachioradialis. Remember that brachioradialis originates on the proximal two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus. So this muscle is not going to be a wrist extensor. It just exists in the posterior compartment. Most sources will say that. In fact, the brachioradialis has a different function its function is elbow flexion. So this muscle is actually synergistic with biceps brachii and brachialis. Now remember that brachioradialis is unique in elbow flexion because it's most active when the forearm is in mid-pronation, mid-supination. Remember that biceps brachii is most active during elbow flexion when the forearms are in complete supination, and brachialis is most active in elbow flexion when the forearms are in pronation. Brachioradialis is most active in elbow flexion in mid-pronation, mid-supination. All right, so if we follow the muscle fibers down, we would see that they would insert on the lateral surface of the distal end of the radius, so roughly at this point right here. So this muscle does not cross the wrist joint, therefore it can have no action on the wrist. Brachioradialis is innervated by the radial nerve, and as we already mentioned, it's a strong elbow flexor, mostly when you're in mid-pronation, mid-supination. The last muscle here in the posterior compartment is the ancaneus. Now, we talked about this muscle when we discussed the posterior compartment of the brachium, only because it's synergistic with the triceps brachii. This muscle is not in the posterior compartment of the brachium. As you can see here, it exists distal to the elbow joint. It can't be in the brachium. This is actually in the posterior compartment of the forearm. But it is synergistic with the triceps brachii, and some sources will actually consider it an extension of the triceps brachii. So its origin is the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, so it still does still does originate at the common extensor origin. However, this muscle is very short, and it does not cross the wrist joint clearly. It actually only extends down to the lateral olecranon process. And so because it doesn't come anywhere near 
the wrist joint, it's only going to be acting at the elbow. And its major function is going to be to assist in elbow extension. Now obviously the triceps brachii do the bulk of that work. But this is going to assist with elbow extension and also prevent impingement. What that means is the ancaneus, part of its insertion is actually on the joint capsule of the elbow. And it's actually going to pull that joint capsule during elbow extension to prevent the joint capsule from being pinched uh, between the humerus and the ulna. Very important, otherwise you'd have elbow impingement. So the ancaneus actually pulls on that joint capsule to prevent it from being squished. Okay? And also ancaneus stabilizes the elbow during pronation and supination. So it's a stabilizer of the elbow joint. And it's also innervated by the radial nerve, um, which remember has contributions from ventral rami, C5 through T1, basically all of the brachial plexus. All right, so those are the muscles of the superficial posterior compartment of the forearm. In the next video, we're going to do a brief review of some of these muscles, and then we're going to really be getting into the deep posterior compartment. That won't take us as long. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.